publishing research. Um, so field work and kind of what I've done in preparing my dissertation and getting my PhD. And so that's it. So I basically I'm acknowledged to you guys that this is a relatively obscure topic. And so I assume that most people are not familiar with what I'm talking about when I say Buddhist banners. So I plan the presentation to function kind of like a general introduction to the subject. Um, I'm going to talk about just the banners themselves, so you guys are familiarized with that. I'm going to talk about why they're made, who makes them, and then the general reasons that they're hung and that they are made. So it just kind of really just functions very much on that level. And so my general focus has been on the unwoven Buddhist banners in mainland Southeast Asia. And I emphasize all these different things because if you start getting into the intricacies of banners, they get really complex really quickly. Um, so I emphasize the word handwoven because, in fact, there's a lot of different kinds of banners out there. Um, so this is just a sampling of what type of handwoven banner I found in my research area. And even just in looking at this slide, you can see the diversity within this category itself. Um, but anyway, so these are all handwoven banners. I emphasize also that they are Buddhist, because even though I'm not going to get into it tonight, um, if you start looking at banners from this region, you'll find that there are banners that are not Buddhist as well. So I just, you know, so there's all these different semantics involved with this title. And then also, um, Thailand and Laos, because it, even though my research area is a little bigger, and I'll talk about that, um, I've expanded my research into Cambodia and other areas, and once you start really looking at banners, you'll see that they're in a lot of different locations. So I'm kind of explaining that side. Okay, so just also to show you what I mean when I say that there's other types of banners that are not handwoven. And this is even just from northern Thailand, Laos, and then this region that I did my research. So there's many other types of Buddhist banners as well. Um, so we have wood banners, and just so you guys see, they kind of, as I say what they are, they go from left to right. Um, so they have wood banners, and these are quite common in northern Thailand. Um, and so they even have a different name. So the Thai word for banner is thum, it's the same as the Cambodian word. Um, so they call them thumbradang, which is like a stiff banner. And then we also have paper banners. So here's the wood. You can see it's painted and also um, has gold leaf. Here's paper. There's many different types of paper, so you can see that there's paper banners. This is a type of paper banner as well. And then we have also like a cut metal, so that's a, a metal banner. So you can get a sense of, you know, once I started exploring this research topic, I was overwhelmed immediately because I went there just thinking I would find cloth banners. And people were like, well, what kind of banners are you talking about? Um, we also have not just handwoven cloth banners, but there's cloth banners that are made for manufactured cloth. And I'll talk about these a little bit more further in my talk, but just to give you guys an idea of different types of cloth banners. So what they do is they take manufactured cloth, cloth that comes with you know, so in here, and they cut them and they do this shape. And even in Laos, we see banners that are made out of money. So again, quite a variety of materials, and so tonight I'm really just talking about one particular type. Okay, and so um, the handwoven banners that are the focus of this talk are not only in northern Thailand and Laos, but they're found in Sipsongkwana, which is, in, in Chinese, it, it, it's an area of Yunnan, it's called Shishongkwana, but it's right here. So often when I mention to people that I've done work Serving these banners in China, it's not, you know, it's this part of China that literally is, is up against Laos and Burma. So, and then they have, so the banners are common throughout this whole region. But in my work, I focus really kind of on this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So often when I talk about the banners in my research, I talk about them as thai banners, and that is a word that's spelled T A I, um, that refers to a very specific ethnic group that is found throughout this region. It's an ethnic group that's in Thailand, Sichuan uh, Sa'an, and the Chances of Burma. Um, we've seen them throughout Laos, of course, as well. And so it's this ethno-linguistic group, and like the Thai people, um, 
Tayu, all these different ethnic groups are part of a larger group. So they have this commonality within their culture. And so it's difficult. That's why I can't really refer to them as being from a certain nation, like the nation of Thailand, because you don't see them throughout Thailand, um, or the country of Laos. So I tend to refer to them by this ethnic group, the ethnic group that I control. Um, so these Thai groups moved into Thailand, Laos, Burma, from China and Vietnam in about the 11th century, and they become politically dominant in the 13th century, so they've been there for a long time, and as long as they've been dominant, the majority of them have been Buddhist. Um, and this is also where the nation of Thailand gets its name. It's Thai and Thai, they're basically the same word. I am not a linguist, so I'm not gonna get into the semantics of that. Um, but anyway, so you see these ethnic groups, and that's kind of what I'm talking about, and why you see it spread into this, you know, larger than just a nation that's right like into this geographical area. So one of the most common questions asked to me that is regarding my research is how I even got interested in these matters because they are so little known outside of this Thai region. Like people are not familiar with banner. So often when I'm doing my research and then outside of there people ask me how in the world did you ever find out about these? So basically when I was working on my master's degree kept getting emphasized to me that I needed to figure out what I was going to write my master's thesis about. <laughs> so I, I had no idea, and I was self-reading one day. I was browsing all these different titles of books, and I came across this book, The Textiles and the Thigh, so now you know that word, Textiles and the Thigh Experience in Southeast Asia. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I never really even it's considered okay. Southeast Asia so much as a place where I wanted to do research, but as I looked through it, I came across and all of the textiles are really beautiful, but I came across these banners, and then just something about it just reached out and grabbed me. And in particular, it was this photograph of, you know, the Buddha image, surrounded by these banners hanging in the space, and I, I really can't explain why, but that's when I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and that's how I became kind of interested in this topic. And so, we fast forward several years later in many, many language classes, and I found myself wandering around parts of rural northern Thailand and Laos in this region trying to find banners because again, because there is so little published on them, it really required a lot of on-the-ground research for me to figure out where they are and all of these other aspects of them. So much of my field work is spent, so as I was talking about, this is really the area that I'm focused on, and that's what I say in the talk. Um, where I went, and you can see, I. I hope you can. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Kind of the areas that I'm going to talk about today. So all of these dots are places where I spent some time kind of photographing banners and talking with people. So you can see it's kind of the north, northern part of northern Thailand. So Chiang Mai is here. Um, Nan Province is over here, and I'll mention. You'll see banners from there. Um, Long Prabang is over here, it's quite well known, so you guys might recognize that, and up through here. So we go to Dingum and, and Chengdung. So that's the area. So because you're going to see these names, and you know, unless you've actually traveled in that area, they're not that familiar, but that gives you a sense of kind of when I talk about these different countries, how they all fall into this kind of Mekong River region. So the research took me through remote villages where I would you know, wander in and, and try to find people to help me look at the textiles at the Wat. Um, and that's another word I'm going to use. Uh, wat is a word that refers to monastery. It's a Buddhist monastery. Wat is the term that is used by the Thai peoples for their monastery. So it's much easier for me just to say Wat. So that you know what that term is. Um, you see it's very mountainous. So this is just to give you a sense of kind of what the area is like, where these people live and are producing um, also, it's quite diverse in terms of wealth of the people and in terms of kind of the styles of the architecture, and so that was really fun for me as well. So what we're seeing are three different examples of Bihan, which are like assembly halls. Um, so Mungun, which is in Laos, is by the Thai border. This one, Metdam, which is really close to uh, Chiang Mai, and then Long Mam Ta. And you can see the variation where, you know, some of these are very poor, community, so they're taking a tin roof and putting it on a building, and that's their sacred place to worship, worship being a loose term. Um, and also a diversity of the Buddha images. So as I'm documenting these banners, it was really fun.
fun for me and the future research I'll refer back to this is the diversity of the other arts as well and how beautiful they are and how rarely we see these things. Uh, you know, when you think of a good image from Thailand, you think of something like the Pramukhtarat or these big, beautiful good images that are golden and sponsored by kings, but in fact, a lot of what I saw wasn't like this. So, I met all sorts of people and I asked them all about the banners, and I think many were surprised by this strange person showing up in the villages asking them about the banners, but they were also really excited because I would show all of this excitement, and I think you know, got them interested in banners as well. And in one village, I was discussing them with a group of of novice monks, it was monks under the age of 20. And it seemed taken aback by my interest because I was really fascinated and I was just taking so many photographs, I would ask them all of these questions. And so finally, one of them steps forward and he asks me why I was asking so many questions about banners and why was I taking so many pictures. He said, don't you have banners? Where do you come from? So I like that story because it also shows kind of how accepted and how much of a part of culture these banners are to that point. Right? It's so much an accepted part of the religion or of the practice that it would seem like everybody would have them, right? So, as hand woven textiles, they bear many similarities to other Thai textiles. And if anybody's familiar with textiles from Thailand and Laos, you'll know they're really well known for their intricate kind of weaving techniques and their intricate designs. Um, they feature the motifs of plants, uh, animals, figures, geometric motifs, and things like that, and that's what we see in the banners as well. Um, they're cotton and silk textiles that are woven on frame looms, and just because, I don't know, some people enjoy textiles, it's nice to know how they're made because that process is so much a part of what they are. Um, so they're made on frame looms, and you can't really get a sense of it from this photo, but the next one you'll see the frame loom means it's this large frame that the textile is woven on. Um, there's basically two different types of frame looms. One has a series of two or more harnesses, which is what you see here, that they weave on. And then they, the pattern that you actually are seeing in the textile, that, that, you know, the animals and the geometry and all of that, it's picked out by hand. So that's what you're seeing here. So it's a very slow process where each yarn is laid in to create this pattern. So you get a sense of, so that's what the hand woven, it really has a sense of the hand in it. So that's one technique. The other one is this type of loom, and you see what I mean more about the frame, of the frame loom here, where actually the weaving pattern is stored in these harnesses. It's quite complex, and I'm not really going to get into detail with it. It's a very sophisticated process, but basically, whatever the pattern is, is stored in these sticks right here. And then what she's doing is pulling apart each one of these yarns goes through here, and so what she's doing is kind of getting the pattern into her cloth by using these harnesses, and that is a very basic explanation. I could go on and on about that, but you know, not you know, it's how they're made, but it's not necessarily the most important thing. I want you to keep away from it. Um, okay. So here's some example of some other textiles, not banners, but five textiles, and these are actually in the ACM collection. Um, they exist in a variety of styles, so there's very intricate skirts, um, articles of dress, there's head cloths, shoulder cloths, blankets, um, pillows, etc. Um, and typically girls, every girl in these areas would be learning how to be from her mother. So in the past, and it's not to give you the impression that every girl knows now, but in the past every girl would have been weaving textiles for her house. So every girl would have had the knowledge to be able to weave a banner if she would like. And it was quite common that every woman would have at some point in her life a woman banner. So now I'm going to present some general statements about the physical appearances of the banners. And I'm going to show you some examples of different banner styles. And again, it's just to give you a sense of the diversity and what I found and how, you know, you just it's easy after you do what I've done to kind of get a sense of, like, if I saw a banner, I could probably have a pretty good idea of where it's from because I've spent so much time looking at these things because they do look different in different locations. So you can see just here, 
that banners are quite different. So you think of a handle of a banner, you're going to see it quite a different. You see five different banners, you're probably going to see very different ones. Um, so the banners are woven by women. Uh, usually these designs are picked out by hand. They're usually long and narrow. So these are kind of the standard physical description of the banners. They vary in length between one and four meters, and they're usually they can be really narrow, uh, a few, you know, five, six inches. Sorry, I have to go inches. It's the American in me coming up. Then they, they can be relatively wide as well, to like, you know, 30 inches across. And while the long, narrow dimensions are unmistakably the nature of woven cloth, um, it's also clear that they're exaggerated. This length is exaggerated to enhance the function of banners. And it kind of it also enhances their symbolic meaning, which I will talk about later as well. And in terms of materials, these banners are usually made with white rounds, like the white cloth, and then the colorful supplementary web yarns, the colorful additions and the patterning, right? So they're usually white, and then the pattern is very colorful. Um, the ground is often cotton, but often, now you're going to see that they're made from manufactured fibers, like acrylic yarn. So it gives this change of materials that shouldn't surprise you because if people were making their own materials, they would have used natural ones that they would have harvested. Whereas now if you go to the market, you can buy your yarn and it's you know, cheap acrylic. Um, some banners contain bamboo strips that are actually what create the pattern. So you don't just assume that it's all cloth. Often there's bamboo. So you can get a sense of that from this detail. You can see the that strip that's you know somewhat wider, that's bamboo that then has been covered with metallic paper. Um, and then this also is bamboo, so it's that thick. And that's what's used to actually create the pattern within the banner. So these are really common both in Northern Thailand and Laos. Um, this one is Northern Thai and this one's Lao. So they have a different style to that, but it's a common type of banner that you would see. And not all banners are going to be solidly woven through the whole length. If you look at banners, they're often um, contain gaps of unwoven warp yarns. And the warp is the yarn that goes through the, the loom. And it's just a few, a few things woven in here and there to keep them from tangling, right? It's, there's a practical side to all of this. So you'll see that this can have um, a symbolic interpretation as well, which I can talk about in a minute. Um, or it can be practical. And so if you think about it as a weaver, you wouldn't really want to be weaving this all, you know, it's quite a lot of work. So it makes sense to me that they've become these textiles that kind of have the pattern in closer to the ground. Like I said, there's always a practical side and then there's a symbolic side. So I know a woman who says, oh, I used to weave all the time, but I just hated doing it so much. I hated sitting there, so I just won't do it anymore. And so you think about that. Just because every woman knows how to weave doesn't mean she's going to want to. <laughs> so anyway, and so you know, I said the symbolic thing basically is as you're climbing up this banner because there's this association with heaven, which I'm going to talk about. The banner is interpreted as a ladder that will help you get there. So those slats have that kind of meaning as well. So I'm still showing you, I'm going to show you some different types of banners that you see. There's zodiac banners, and these are common in northern Thailand. What they have are different animals of the zodiac, um, the 12 animals. And see, again, it's different styles, but each one of these has, you know, here's the horse, and here's the pig, um, and the elephant, which is a northern Thai zodiac animal, um, chicken. So they all have this, um, but they're very common to see. We also have web banners, which are called the Nyai. Um, and these two are common. So they're the banners where you don't see necessarily a lot of patterning, but they're considered kind of like a web because they have these, these gaps in them that I was just talking about. And this one I thought was really clever because it's the Thai flag. <laughs> we also have long funeral banners. Sometimes they're called the which is 20 <coughs> wa is like a, a yard, so it's 20 yards. Um, these are very common in Laos, and they're hung outside their home for funerals, right? So they're very 
Um, I've read a lot about them in northern Thailand, but I've never actually seen them. So I'm not sure if I just have the time to well or if the practice is not so common anymore. Um, but you definitely, if you've been to Long Bon, you have seen these banners for sure, because they're at the what. We also have Pratsat banners. Um, this is a very specific ethnic group that I knew we heard um, in throughout this whole area they're scattered throughout. Um, and the Pratsat is actually this architectural form, and so that's where the name of this type of banner comes from. Pratsat um, translates as palace, basically, castle or palace. You can see it's quite a detailed type of banner. Um, here's other types of banners that don't really have a specific name based on their weaving, but you're going to see them quite often in banner in, in temples. And um, you can get a sense like these three are probably at the same monastery at the same lot, but each woman has kind of interpreted her banner however she wants, right? So she's incorporating different things into the banner. This is not a province in northern Thailand. Uh, and again, so then we move into Laos, and you see what these banners look like. So if you go up to Long Nam Pa, you're going to see a completely different type of banner in, in terms of appearance. And this is kind of, you know, I'm just giving you this basic standard typology that I've, you know, seen. And so it gives you an idea, again, of how you can actually go in and look at these textiles and know them place by place. Um, Lung Sing, this is up to the Chinese border. Okay, so what are these banners for? I'm showing you all of this, but I haven't really talked about what they're used for. You know they're hanging out of what, but what is this about? So I'm going to talk about that now. Donation of, home, of hand woven banners, it always takes place at the monastery. It's always at the what. And while they may be donated at any time of year, there are certain occasions that are really ideal for merit making, and that's when it's most common for people to take them in. Um, to donate them to the monks at the Wat. For example, during Songkran, which is the Thai or Lao New Year, um, banners are brought to the monastery, they're hung inside, and you know, they're given dedications and then hung. So this is a really important time for banners to be brought in. When I would ask people about them, I'd say, well, when, when do you take banners? And donate them, and they would often say Songkran. So I know it's very good, it's a very auspicious merit making to them. Um, so while they're, before they're hung in the hall, they're given to monks who then record the donor's intentions, um, and often you'll actually see that written on the banner, depending on what area you're in. So it's very important, this idea that they're giving the banner for this reason, and that everybody knows and reports this. Other banners are displayed on these long poles, which I mentioned, and this is after a funeral, and it's to commemorate the deceased and assist them to get to heaven. So they're very long, you can see how they reach up in this. Banners are also displayed around the grounds of the Wat and on surrounding roads for very specific holidays or celebrations. And so these festival banners don't really differ in appearance from the ones that are hanging inside of the buildings. Um, whether or not this is the case in the past, I don't know, because I have no documentation that really tells me that. Um, and they're kept in storage when not in use. So basically, they have like a closet at the Watt, and they say, oh, we're going to have our festival. So they pull all of these banners out, and then they hang them. And so if you're traveling around, particularly in northern Thailand, and it's the festival time of year, you immediately know if there's going to be a celebration at the Watt, because the roads are just lined with these banners. It's really eye-catching which is exactly the intention. Um, but what's interesting about all these different types of banners and all these different uses for them is that, and this was really nicely emphasized to me by a young monk, um, that all of these banners have the same meaning. He said, no, this is a monk I was talking to in Northern Laos, he said, no matter what the banners look like or where they are hung, they all have the same meaning, which is to gain merit and help the deceased get to heaven. Banners are typically donated by women who make them, who then gain merit for themselves, and then transfer much of this merit to a deceased relative, such as a parent or a grandparent. And this is in order to help them get, have a better next life, basically. So to give you a small amount of detail, as I'm saying merit, 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 about the religious context. So for 
for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Buddhism that's practiced in this area is called Theravada, so Theravada Buddhism. And, and I'm just giving you like the most basic thing, but basically it follows the Pali canon, and it focuses its emphasis on the historical Buddha and his teachings. Uh, Theravada can be translated to Way of the Elders, which is a reference to its early development as a Buddhist tradition. Um, and it's this form that's practiced in this area typically favors males, specifically in terms of who controls the texts, um, who controls the teachings, and more importantly, perhaps, regarding the acquisition of merit. Merit is a key concept of Theravada Buddhism and the main purpose for the donation of the manners. Merit is accrued through good action or good karma over a series of births. So, you know, there's this little idea that we're being, you know, we're born and then we die, we're born. And so as each time we're born, we accrue merit and we're building this merit that can then be applied into the next life. Um, so the merit that is required comes through good action and this attention. And this is where the banners come into play because charity or giving is one of the, the principal means that people focus on for gaining merit in this area of Thailand, Laos, and Burma, this whole region. Merit is desired by most lay people in order to improve their circumstances in the next life. So if I'm a rice farmer and I want to have a better life in my next life, and I focus on merit, then I can believe that I'm going to you know, have more wealth or health, happiness, these kinds of things. Since merit is the main focus for most Buddhist die, it is important to note that the most meritorious action is to be ordained as a monk. This is important because I tend to focus on the women, as women are the ones who make the banners, and women cannot be ordained, and so they are actually denied this opportunity for gaining a great deal of merit. Throughout Thailand and Laos, nearly every male has been ordained, and, and it's only for a short period of time quite often, but again, this emphasizes how important that action is. Many men continue to be involved with their local monasteries throughout their lives, and they assist with ceremonies, or they kind of do different things. They help make decisions about what's going to happen. And this is another important way of gaining merit that's not available to women. So the merit of a son or a husband who has been ordained may be transferred to the mother or wife. But with such a gender disadvantage that exists in Buddhism, the question is, is if merit so important, how can women merit. So not a lot of researchers have really focused on this aspect of Buddhism, but one that has is Leland Lefferts, who's, if you go back to that book that made me want to study this to begin with, he was the co-author on that, probably not coincidentally. Um, but there's this relationship between women and Buddhism that's not quite as obvious as going to a lot and seeing monks, right? But then, as I will discuss, you see that it's really women who have this presence at the monastery. Um, in fact, monks are supported entirely by laity, and usually what they are doing is supporting them through food and through clothes. And who's responsible for food and clothes? It's women, right? Um, and so that's kind of one of the ways that we see within Theravada Buddhism, within the Buddhism that's practiced in Thailand and Laos, is that women are able to donate these things to the Wat and they gain merit. So if you talk to Thai Buddhists and you want to know what they're doing, they always talk about gaining merit. And so um, when in the past, they would have also donated hand-woven monk's robes. Um, monk's robes are now prepackaged factory produced cloths that people just go to a store and purchase. But in the past, women would have woven cloth and then they would have donated at the Wat. Um, if I understand correctly, this would have been white cloth that would have been sewn and then dyed. Um, and it would have been only a very specific time that this cloth would have been donated. It would have been either for an ordination or on a very specific holiday. Um, but then again, now people are reading less and this cloth is available, purchased, so it's not something we see quite often in practice. But monks robes are not their only possession. They also have other textiles that were traditionally donated by the lady. And these, again, were handled by women. So you would have seen bags. Um, all the monks have bags that they carry around with them. And manuscript covers 
or any other really important textile. So again, this is to emphasize kind of not only how Buddhism is practiced and this intricate relationship between women and, and the monks, but also to show you that banners are not the only textile that kind of play an important role in this area. So the interesting thing to me as I was doing this research is that, okay, so everybody would talk about, okay, we give these banners for merit. This is why you do this, we do it for merit. Um, however, if you look at these things that I talked about, women give food to monks, women give monks robes to monks, they all have a very specific function, right? You give something that's functional and in return you receive merit. But the banners differ from other donations in that they don't have this utilitarian purpose. So in other words, unlike food, robes, manuscript cover, covers, the banners do not sustain the monks or the monastery in general. So a question that I ask in kind of looking at this diverse array of banners is if merit is gained from following Buddhist precepts and practicing charity or generosity in these things, how do banners fit into the system? In other words, how do the banners function as objects of merit? And this is one of the ongoing questions that I've kind of asked in my work. One of many, many <laughs> ongoing questions. So what I propose is that the banner's function uh, is primarily as an object of beauty. That they work to beautify and define the sacred space where the monks and laity come together and share in the Dhamma, share in the teachings of the Buddha. On the surface, this may seem like actually a relatively simple explanation, but closer consideration shows the importance of beauty at the Buddhist monastery. For example, laity work with the monks keep the grounds of the monastery very clean. So if you've really spent time in this region at all, you'll notice that a lot of time is spent cleaning. You'll see novices in the morning cleaning. You'll see, um, I've seen in one town that I've spent a lot of time, people come and bring flowers to the water. So it's just this constant attention to making it as clean as they can. Um, also, um, this pride is taken in the what? And again, like I tried to point out at the beginning is that I'm looking at a lot of rural communities, a lot of rice farming communities. So you're talking about communities that don't have a lot in terms of material possessions. So one of the things they can all take pride in together is again, it's the what, it's the Buddhist monastery where they all come together in celebrations and things like that. So they might not be able to afford those golden Buddha images or you know, these things, but they can all do what they can together to create this environment. And I think that that's a role that the banners play as well. And so this gives you a sense of that uh, in my slide. So often you'll come into these watts, into these buildings, and it's completely white. Right? There's not even murals. It's not a really strong mural tradition in this region. It's changing. It's looking. You would see all these white walls, but then the banners come in and they add color and they fill this space. And most importantly, weavers and monks emphasize beauty when they're discussing the banners themselves, and that's kind of really what got me thinking about this. So I think far from the superficial answer, it demonstrates that this role of banners is really important. Banners as beautiful objects. It certainly makes sense as well when a woman is creating a banner to be hung in the local monastery where everybody goes that everybody's going to see it, and then she's going to take great care in making it this beautiful object. And I think that helps to explain, as I've shown you guys all these different banners, the attention that people pay in creating them. You know, it can take several weeks, even longer, to create these intricate patterns, and that's why they would spend so much time on them, because then everybody gets to see it. You can almost see it as being like your local art gallery or something like that. Um, so that shows off her creativity, it shows off her skill, it shows off her dedication to Buddhism. Uh, and motif and color selection are attributed to beauty as well. So if you really start talking to women about why you've done this, you know, like why are you doing this, and they'll talk about how important it is for the banner to be beautiful. And so when looking at this variety of motifs on the banners, um, it seems likely that, again, with this knowledge that they're going to be hanging at the Wat, that they have this Buddhist function, that that, again, comes in and influences what women are weaving into the banners. So I thought I would show you a selection of banners that have explicit 
perfectly good motifs. And as you see, as I've already gone through it, it's not necessarily the case with all of the banners, but I just wanted to show you again this kind of knowledge of where they're going to be and this influence of, of Buddhism on the banners. And so we see it pretty obvious here, we're seeing Buddha images. Um, you don't see Buddha images in banners throughout the whole region. It's only in a few locations that you would actually see this. But this is an excellent example of creativity and, and just knowledge. And here we see Matorani. And this is actually uh, in Burma. But Matorani, for those of you who aren't sure who she is, or maybe recognize her, um, she's a very, very popular female kind of Mother Earth deity. Um, and she's found in many monasteries. So basically her story is that as the Buddha gains enlightenment, so as, as the Buddha's meditating under the Bodhi tree and then he's about to gain enlightenment and he is putting, calling the earth to witness the armies of Mara come up, right? Mara is trying to distract the Buddha from this moment. And Mantorani comes out and, excuse me, and so she brings out her hair, which is full of water and it's this accumulation of merit. And so she, washes away these armies, and this is what gives the Buddha that opportunity to run and be that moment of enlightenment. And so, and again, you can also see how important women are in this role. Um, so we also see Naga, which are important. Um, we see them all over at the Wats in this region, but you see them featured in the banners. So again, what, what we see at the Wat, we see we see stupas. And um, here is that Brasat banner that I showed you earlier. Um, and this is a Brasat structure, um, which is actually a funerary symbol, but it's quite common in terms of Buddhist funerals. So here I tried to show you an example of a Brasat that's actually used in the funeral of a very important monk in the town of Nan. Um, and this prasat itself. So again, we're seeing this motif and then this connection to an actual Buddhist practice in the region. Um, yeah, so the prasat is used in funerals for people, uh, mostly very important people. And when it's burned, it functions as this cosmological model that represents heaven. So it's this idea that when it burns, that person who is deceased is able to go and reach heaven. So you can think about what that means if you're looking at this in terms of a funeral or if you're looking at it in terms of a banner. And if you're putting it on a banner, then you're able to also help this deceased person get to heaven. But again, and instead of it just being a really important person or a really important monk, you're suddenly making it accessible to everybody. Because if everybody is able to read this type of banner, then they're able to kind of create this ability for themselves or a deceased person to go to heaven. The connection between banners and heaven is a really important one that I've kind of alluded to as I've been talking, and I don't think it can be ignored. In discussing banners, people often describe them as helping the deceased to get to heaven. Why do you donate banners? If they don't say it's for merit, they'll say to go to heaven. Um, and also, I mentioned this idea that sometimes those, those slats in the banners are interpreted as helping like a ladder helping people climb to heaven. So again, it's this idea of heaven and heaven. Um, some explicitly state that ancestors are going to be, in, if they're born in hell, right? Because there's this hierarchy, there's this cosmology within Buddhism, and you might get born in hell, but if somebody has been born in hell, and you don't need a banner of the body in their name, they're able to grab onto that banner, and get yanked out of hell, and be able to go to heaven. Okay, so it's this idea that we're doing all of these things, not necessarily even for ourselves, but maybe for somebody else, like a deceased ancestor. Um, and then I put this photographs up here to kind of emphasize why, like, the nature of banners themselves might help people to create this, this interpretation of banners. Because if you look, for instance, this funerary banner is so tall, right? This flat banner makes a lot of sense that it would be reaching up to heaven, and that's the ones in the walk are the same way. And the connection between banners of heaven is one um, that we also see in painted depictions. And I, I, this is something that I'm really fascinated with and I have not had time to work on at all um, in terms of my research, which is one of the next steps I will get to. But if you look at painted images of, uh, of Tabatim to heaven or the Chulamani Chaito, which is Indra's heaven, it's this really important supra, it'll be flanked by banners. And this is the heaven that everybody wants to go to. So then again, we have banners, and it's a banner heaven connection. And so 
So it's, and it's not just in the region I've been talking about. For instance, this is a Cambodian Ethiopian region. Uh, this is one that's much more local. This is in Zipsukwana. And also, um, I want to also say that it's not just the Thai people that have this connection between banners and heaven. So I wanted to bring in kind of a diversity of places and images to show you. Um, this is a, a painted image from Kuklong. It's a Chinese image. Of, of the, in this image, they say it's the Bodhisattva. We can't necessarily say it's Avalokiteshvara because there's not some very specific identifying things. But look, if you see, there's a banner here. And this is a woman who's recently died, and she is being led to heaven by this bodhisattva who's holding a banner, right? Heaven or, or paradise. Um, and then again, this is in Cambodia, and I've done research there, and when I talk to people, they talk about the connection between banners and heaven. And I like this image because it, again, brings in this emphasis of this link. And now when you look up, it looks like it's going to appear to heaven. And you even see this connection between banners and, and heaven in non-Buddhist groups as well. And I haven't really been working there, but people who have done work with ethnic minorities in Northern Thailand have said, oh, they have banners too, Rebecca. Um, so this is um, me and I think people, but they have this association with banners and heaven as well. And it's, it's, they put them on the bamboo poles. You see how they reach to heaven. This is an ongoing thing. This is something I'm very much interested in as well. So it's objects woven specifically for display at the monastery. And so we know that we know they're beautiful. We know they're given for merit, uh, providing connections to heaven. Um, I just kind of always want to emphasize that they're women's creative contribution to the lot. And I, I just think this is really important. Uh, you think about all of the other art forms that you see at the Wat, and it's, it's men. Men are making the Buddha images, men are building the buildings and all of these things. And the banners, again, represent women. But, there's always a but. Um, modernization and contemporary change. People ask me this, is this, a, is this a tradition that's continuing? Is it something? Because it relies so much on this hand making, right? This, this, uh, Weaving that's not necessarily done. I mean, like I said about the woman who said, I'd much rather be out in the rice fields than weaving. It's, it's not an option for a lot of people anymore to weave. So it is asked of me, you know, how much is this continuing? And it's something that I'm very much interested in as well, as I've been going to this region over the years and seeing how it's changed. And for anyone who's traveled in Laos in particular, it's very obvious, but in, in Northern Thailand, in Sipsang Prana, Burma, you see that modernization and change are coming very quickly. And because of this, I just want to talk about, you know, textile production has changed, um, and how has that affected the banner? So we see changes in materials, right? So maybe the banners in the past would have been made from cotton, or from materials that would have been grown around the village, but now we're seeing the materials coming in that are purchased in the market, that seems kind of minor compared to some other details of what the change would be. But again, it's changes are in moderation or you know, in steps. Um, let's see. Production techniques, so I'll talk about that in a, sec a second. But it all is affected by kind of this idea of affordability and this accessibility. Um, and it's easy to step outside and say, oh, what a shame, they're not weaving anymore. But if you think about, like I was saying, I keep using her as an example, but if, you know, not everybody wants to be, or if you have to feed your family and you need to be working outside of the home, or all of these different reasons um, that would affect why you're making textiles or not. And I think it's important to kind of take into consideration when talking about change. Also, Changes are happily embraced by artists. Like the fact that, you know, you take a banner and you have the thing that's woven the whole length, that's going to take a lot more time than if you weave the really intricate thing at the bottom, which is the ones that move to the top. So there's a practicality to change as well. So basically, in terms of the banners, there's two distinct changes occurring that I am seeing, or I am identifying as two changes. First is that they're woven by only a handful of women. So whereas in the past, as people were talking to me within their lifetimes, they would have all brought a banner to the lot 
Now, fewer people will bring them, or you'll have a village and everybody will go buy the brand or at the market instead of leaving it themselves. Right? So you'll have only a handful of people weaving them, and when you might have a lot of people dedicating them and not allocating them themselves, so then you don't see that personal interpretation of richness that I kind of emphasized at the beginning of my talk. Um, so the banners don't vary as much in appearance. So like this, here's some banners for sale. Let's see, okay, maybe I'll buy the green banner and not the yellow one, but they all look identical. Um, and then also, um, they're taking on kind of, instead of just a regional style, location by location, long run dot has this type of and has this type of banner. Now you see that there's kind of this pan northern Thai style banner, or a pan Lao banner. You know, so you can see, I, I know that this is from Laos, but you can't tell exactly where. And so that's definitely something that's happening. And then, of course, so this is just an example of also Chiang Mai, we know it's a very big tourist place, so they'll hang these out in front of tourist places as well. So they're using them to catch the eye, not for religious. And then I talked about this type of banner at the beginning of my talk, this manufactured cloth banner. And so this is the other change that I kind of wanted to mention, is that instead of hand weaving them, we'll see people bringing banners to the Y, but um, they're just taking a piece of cloth and making a banner. So you might walk into a Y and see a ton of these banners hanging, but none of them will be hand woven. And that's very common. Uh, I remember this one place, when I was in Long Island, I was really excited for the Lao New Year, and, and I was talking with a bunch of novice monks, and they kept saying, oh, but you're going to be very disappointed the banners are not very beautiful this year. And I said, I don't care, I just want to see them. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's, they're very aware of the fact that this is happening. Uh, it's not, you know, but it's for making merit, right? Um, and so with all of this increased uniformity, and that's really what we're seeing, I ask if there's a loss of personal expression for the women and what this means for the women. Because if we're talking about something that's there for merit, what does this mean, right? In terms of the fundamental meaning of the banners. Um, and I think that there's this personal touch that they're still able to add to the banner. So, right, so each one of these banners that we're looking at here is a contempt, uh, manufactured cloth banner, but each one looks completely different. So we're still seeing that individuality kind of being expressed in the banner. It's just not taking that tactile quality of the hand woven ones that, that we love so much. But you still see that each one has its own style, its own embellishments added. My friends mentioned they love netting. They love making banners for netting. I don't know why. But I see it everywhere. So finally, if the women are not personally making the matters, is there an effect on their ability to make merit? Really, that's what I'm asking. Um, and my thought is actually that, that it's not really going to affect the ability to make merit. That the banners, the banners generate merit regardless of their origin. And I want to stress that although these changes in banner production are taking, all, taking place all over the area that I've done research in, um, Overall, I've not seen a change in the use or the meaning of banners when they're donated at the monastery. So while banners may not be made locally, um, so they might be made, I mean, they might be purchased in the marketplace, or while they might be made from purchased cloth and they're not hand woven, they're still donated in exactly the same way that they would have been donated had they been hand And they have the same intentions and thus the same results as the local hand woven banners. And I think that's a test to the strength of this actual tradition. Um, it, it also attests to the meaning and the importance of the merit to be gained from their donation and hanging. And so to conclude, the hand-woven Buddhist banners that I focus on here define and add beauty to the sacred space of the monasteries. Um, and then they also simultaneously display this individual creativity. Uh, traditions, uh, women's stories, and local Buddhist landscapes. Um, they also incorporate these Thai textile designs, because when you really start looking at it, you can see the similarity between, between different types of textiles. Um, but they wed these textile designs to specific Buddhist imagery. Um, and that the meaning and purpose of the banners is important to the women who make and donate them. So even as the contemporary environment
environment changes and the union becomes less widespread, women find a way to continue with banner production or purchase and donation. And the reason I put this image up when I'm talking about this is you can kind of see it, the care that the women are still taking in their manners. And they're, you know, they're waiting for them to be hung, basically. You can kind of see in the background here, this young monk, he's the one who's responsible for hanging them up and they've been donated. You see each woman is still taking that care. You can actually see it here. And that's what I kind of want to emphasize is that you know, it's easy to see that these banners aren't being woven in the way that they might have been in the past. Um, and things are changing quickly. And then that adds this urgency to my research because I want to document everything I can before they disappear. But I can't predict that they're going to remain abundant in number. But I think that this tradition will continue just to achieve. 